you, Gavin. A lot of rich stuff there, and I, I'm sure we'll come back in discussion to um, a number of the points you've made there. Uh, I just want to go to Chris, um, and um, the, the IMF um, has um, something called a, an IMF Catastrophe Containment Trust. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and its relevance to the kind of thing we're talking about here, to pandemic emergencies, and um, how is it financed? How could it be used? How, how does it work? Okay, um, thank you very much, Peter. Pleasure to be here today. Um, I guess we're, we're normally more normally associated with surveillance of macroeconomic policies and fin dealing with financial disasters, but we've long at the fund had an engagement with countries that are facing natural disasters. Um, and just just to sort of preface how we got uh, into the Ebola, uh, supporting the countries most affected by Ebola. Um, we have financial reserves that we can lend to a country that has been hit by a natural, natural disaster. We can lend to the central bank, or we can lend, to, in other words, to support the exchange rate and um, uh, external payments, or we can lend to the budget, uh, which would help close financing gaps that might be emerging as a result of that, um, of that disaster. Uh, and also, it may give comfort to other financiers who, if we're willing to put our money into the budget, um, they might also be willing to do, because we, ha we have some uh, safeguards in terms of uh, where we will uh, lend and where we won't lend. Um, so, but for natural disasters, we're mostly engaging with low-income countries. They don't have market access, so they can't do what Mexico did uh, when, when H1N1 hit, which is go to the markets and borrow more. Uh, markets are essentially closed to them. Um, so. Once the macroeconomic impact of Ebola began to be felt in Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone last summer, um, we got requests, uh, can you provide us some emergency financing? We have uh, emergency financing needs. Um, so we responded with our traditional facilities, um, uh, although they're concessional, zero interest loans. Um, and we provided about, well, in September 17th was the first disbursement, and then again in January, February, uh, when, it, when it became clear that the macro impact of these uh, epidemics was going to be much, much larger than we had expected. So in total, we provided about 300 million. But even though it was on favorable terms, one thing I think we found was rather troubling was that the cost of dealing with this epidemic shouldn't predominantly fall on the low-income countries themselves. As, as people have remarked earlier, it's the international community that's benefiting from containing an ep epidemic. These countries don't have a high capacity to take on debt, and we were lending to them. So we, we felt, actually, ultimately, that what we should be doing is um, either providing grants or providing debt relief um, to, to lessen the payment burden that, that they're facing. Um, now, we already had a mechanism called the post-catastrophe debt relief facility that we introduced in 2010, where we gave debt relief to Haiti after the, uh, the earthquake. But it didn't really, it, it dealt with uh, catastrophic uh, events that destroyed property. Uh, it didn't really deal with the sort of human disaster in the form of pandemics. So basically what we thought we'd do is we'll modify this so that it can also apply in some, in public health disasters. Um, so that we can provide debt relief rather than actually we decide on debt relief rather than grants. Um, and that will defray the cost of lending to these countries to deal with their financing needs. So um, uh, basically we set it up. Uh, we felt we'd need $370 million to, to fund it. Um, and uh, this would cover a group of uh, basically fragile states, low-income countries, uh, about 37 low-income countries. Uh, both for earthquake-type disasters and health disasters. Uh, 370 million, we had 150 million already, which we, was in the earthquake fund, essentially. Um, we had some other amounts left over from uh, the, the uh, debt relief operations that we've been doing over the past decade. And we figured that we needed about another 150 million in bilateral contributions. The bank and the fund raised pandemic financing at the G20 meeting in Brisbane in November. Um, we launched the facility in uh, February this year. We already had some money, so we dispersed the debt relief in March <coughs> to the three countries. Uh, since then, we've got more than half of the bilateral contributions um, 
close to 90 million from the UK, Germany, Mexico, uh, Austria, and Portugal. So we're reasonably well on the way. And we could do with a bit more money, but we have enough money to deal with another pandemic or a couple of earthquakes. Thank you. <laughs> so just to be clear, this is not just um, a new mechanism for deploying existing IMF funds. It is also a mechanism that is being used to attract new bilateral contributions from um, particular uh, member states. Correct, yeah. yeah. Um, can I just ask a little bit about how it's envisaged being used? The IMF is um, well known for attaching conditionality to its loans, often around macroeconomic management and so on. Um, uh, in, in a situation like um, uh, a pandemic, is there going to be conditionality around the the way the epidemic is being managed, and um, how is this going to work in a state that is frail or um, struggling to um, deal with a situation? Yeah. So, um, pandemic well, emergency financing. All of our emergency financing has no uh, ex post. Uh, conditionality. We do require, for example, uh, we do require, however, that the recipient states that they are taking steps to address the economic and financing imbalances that we are seeking to partially um, cover. I, I don't feel that it's the bar is particularly high. We don't have any expertise as to whether they are taking the right steps to, say, address the economic impact of a pandemic. Um, so we require um, uh, a statement. But at the same time, the amount of funding that's available is, by IMF terms, still relatively limited. So if we were to provide larger amounts, then there would be ex post um, conditionality. 